Ja, yeah, on. Two twins. Yeah. Episode two. We made it to two. We made it to two. I have a question for you. Would uh, you like really to- quick, should we tell everybody what time it is? Just for fun? For just for funsies? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Well, it's 1217 in the morning right now. We're burning the midnight oil, literally doing it. It's, it's 1217 in the AM and you're watching Perspectives. <laughs> Remember, remember that old bit? Absolutely. But anyway, yes, we are burning we the are, oil. Tonight. We are burning the oil. Let's start with a couple questions that I have for you. Ready for this? Yes. So T, what were the last words spoken before the drummer got kicked out of the band? What were they? Hey, why don't we try one of my songs? <laughs> What's the last spoken yeah. like a drummer? What's the last sound that you heard before the band broke up? What was the last sound? The drummer singing. Unless you're unless you're Phil. Phil. Young Phil. Young Phil. So tonight we're going to uh look into our good friend Phil and uh Learn a little bit about his debut and what happens when you let the drummer sing. Remember when Ringo sang? I believe that was Octopus's Garden and Yellow Submarine, right? Yes, there, yes. Were there any others? Uh, there might have been a couple more, but those are certainly the two m- most famous or infamous, depending on depending on your uh, perspective. Did they let Did they let Ringo out of the vocal cage uh, any <laughs> any other times than those two? Well, certainly when he went on to make his uh, several solo albums, they did. But uh, tonight we'll explore what happens when the drummer starts a singing. Uh, but before we get into uh, feel, let's take it around and round. T, round and round. Uh, what are you listening to? What's on your turntable right now? Well... One of them just happened last night, and you and I have have spoken about this today, but the band Hum, who I guess most would consider a one-hit wonder from their hit single, Stars, which was in uh, 19... 96? 96, sounds about right. 95, 96, one of those two. 1995 95. and that was off of their first major album. You'd prefer an astronaut. They released another album downward, downward as heavenward in 1998. And then these guys went as silent as any band with a song that was that big can possibly go. And then 22 years later, yesterday decided to in somewhat surprising fashion release a new album called inlet and i listened to it already like four times today and it's pretty amazing it's on it's available on Bandcamp. they do have a vinyl and a cd version coming which you can order but man um i'm gonna have to go back and listen to the first two albums a a bit more just to get even better, you know, greater context, but this, this could be something it it could be onto something with this one. It was, it was one of the better, most pleasing listens uh, of a new album I've had in some time. So, so that is definitely in the rotation, the beach boys, uh, Carl and the passions. So tough, which is always kind of a tricky album title. Cause you know, I think that, I think the joke was that the, the band, was was Carl and the Passions, and the album was called So Tough, but that's kind of the name of the whole album. I, you know, I don't know. The Beach Boys were getting getting weird at this time, but that is one that uh, I'm kind of realizing I really liked Carl Wilson. You know, obviously his vocals um, were a very important part to a lot of songs. 
God only knows being one that comes immediately to mind. And, and uh, as Brian started to, Brian Wilson started to get kind of goofy, Carl really kind of took over more influence over the band. And this was the first album that displayed that. There are also a couple of really nice mellow songs from Dennis Wilson, who obviously, you know, eventually got to the point where he was creating his own music too. So it's an interesting album in the time period of that, of that great band. Uh, and one that I've been um, revisiting here of late. And the third is uh, a, a hometown piano player named Jim Bajor, uh, who uh, Nubs and I are very familiar with. We used to listen to this a lot when we were a kid, when we were kids and we were falling asleep or trying to, uh, because our mom actually used to play it for us. But his album, Awakenings, has now become the soundtrack for for my seven and six-year-olds um at bedtime and it's a very very pleasant uh wonderful collection of uh instrumental piano from the great uh jim bajer who hailed from the uh detroit area so those are the three things on my radar what do you got nubs i've been listening to uh dream theater a change of seasons which actually is an ep but falls under the the album category for sure. 1995 is when that came out. Trying to get a little bit back into Dream Theater. Been watching some Mike Portnoy stuff uh, on YouTube and kind of remembering just how good they were. Been listening to Yes's Fly From Here, uh, but it's actually Mm. called Fly From Here Return Trip. They made an album uh, in the mid-2000s with who I believe was their second or third singer that they've had of recent his name was Benoit David and it's a great album. And for return trip, they actually had Trevor Horn come in and record the lead vocals, which is the original lineup for the album drama. Mm-hmm. So it's the fly from here album with Trevor Horn on vocals and some remastering and things like that. And so I've been checking that out. I just picked it up, even though it's been out for a couple of years. And Trevor Horn was video killed the radio star, correct? Yes. He, he was in the buggles with Jeff Downs and they had that huge hit. And then they became part of Yes when John Anderson and Rick Wakeman left the band to record Drama, which is a pretty beloved album among Yes fans. Great album. And, and then they broke up and Yes went into the 90125 era. And uh, at that point, Drama lineup didn't do anything until this Fly From Here project, which Trevor Horn originally produced. And then he came on and kind of replaced the lead vocals with his own voice is a little bit of a reissue marketing ploy, I think, but also it was a good way to recapture that drama lineup. So been digging that. And then uh, Genesis Duke, which strongly connects to tonight's conversation because it was actually released right around the same year as tonight's album, which says a lot. And so I want to get some context there. Not that I ever need a big excuse to listen to Duke. <laughs> Cool. Well, that's round and round. So uh, as mentioned, tonight is the night for Phil. Phil Collins' Face Value is tonight's featured album. And it's an album that uh, I think a lot of people probably take for granted in some ways without really knowing some of the pretty extraordinary storylines that go into it. Uh, There's nothing about this album that is simple except for the music itself. And that's what's really cool about it is there's some elements of it that you might never guess would be a Phil Collins trademark. And it's a surprising album to listen to. And I think that if people discover it or rediscover it, they might hear a few things that are unexpected, especially because of what Phil Collins turned into. So uh, why don't we get into the nerdy deets and dig in a little bit. You want some dirty deets? Yeah! You want some dirty <laughs> Thank you, Brian Johnson. <laughs> so let's get into the nerdy deets. Uh, Face Value was released on February 13th, 1981. Now, why is this interesting for you and I? That means that we were 364 days old. Correct. On the day this album was released. And I'm sure we were both very excited for the release. Oh, no question. You know? I remember you rolled around in your crib, couldn't wait for the Phil first solo album. Well, you know, we were both, I mean, at that time we were really just starting to come down from the, and then there were three (laughs) 
sort of phase that we were going through during the first year of our life. Cause I remember that certainly being a favorite at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, uh, the album says it was produced by Phil Collins, which is a little bit of a stretch. Really Hugh Padgham should be getting a lot of credit for the production. He gets, a, it says assisted by is the language that they used in the liner notes. And then they did say engineered by, and we'll talk a little bit more about Hugh Padgham as we go. Uh, this actually is the first album that he ever even was a co-producer on. So you think in a short period of time, he went on to produce the police's synchronicity and many, many other groundbreaking albums uh, during the 1980s. And his sound became a huge trademark of the decade. There were a, a ton of musicians on this album. So many, you, you would never go through them all, but some of the ones that stand out, uh, Eric Clapton appears on a couple tracks, which we'll talk about. Uh, Daryl Stormer, who's a longtime collaborator of Phil's and, and a, a touring member of Genesis was on the album. Uh, Alfonso Johnson played bass on the album. He, of course, of Weather Report. Anybody who's associated with Weather Report, you know, gets a tremendous amount of street cred right off the bat. And the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire horns, which is a huge part of Phil's solo career and something we'll talk more about as we get into some of the songs. So a long list of, of guest musicians. And the reason for that is Phil was just starting out at this point. Uh, this is truly a drummer who was recording home demos and it's sort of, it's one of the great accidental albums of all time. Even Phil has said in, in time that he really didn't think this was going to become an album. He didn't set out to make an album. It's groundbreaking in its use of, of home studios. You know, nowadays home studios is what everybody uses and we can build a home studio out of our personal computers. Back then, Phil actually built a home studio in his house just to learn equipment. And that's really what face value came out of. The other element of it that's really interesting is, you know, Phil's kind of pissed in this album. And I'm sure anybody that's heard it can, can tell. It's because these are really all documents of a divorce that he was going through. He was going through a pretty messy divorce with his first wife. And face value was him basically saying, all right, I've moved out and I can build a home studio and now I'm going to start learning equipment and getting down some ideas. And that's really how this album came to be. It was not something that came out of a, a vision to create a, a solo album. It's just home tapes that became something even more than Phil thought they would be and then became his first solo album. One interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize, Phil was the last member of Genesis to record a solo album. Every other original member had already put out at least one solo album, in some cases a couple. And so Phil was late to the party in that way. And I don't think anybody predicted that he would eventually become far and away the most popular solo member of Genesis. I was really surprised that Leland Sklar didn't play bass on this album. I, I actually, you know, just kind of assumed that for all of, you know, Phil's classic period of albums, which would include this and No Jacket Required and what was, the, what was the other one? Hello, I Must Be Going and But oh, Seriously. Cool. But yeah. Seriously, yeah. yeah. I kind of assumed that, you know, he just played on all of those and, you know, obviously... Alfonso Johnson was tapped for that role and, you know, who was from the weather report. So, so Phil obviously wanted to get really deep into those immediate influences. And, and there were many. The album was recorded sort of at a really hot time for Genesis. Uh, Duke had come out and Duke actually had their first number one hit single on it, which was misunderstanding which was an, a song that was written for face value or at least written as part of this initial batch of songs by Phil and Phil didn't think it belonged on a solo album. He thought it should be on a Genesis album because he knew that Genesis could use a hit because they were coming off of, and then there were three, which wasn't a, a very popular album. It had follow you, follow me, which was a big hit, but I think they got a little taste there and were looking for something bigger. And I think Phil knew that misunderstanding was, was a clear hit in the making, but that's one song that was left off a of face value and instead used on Duke. Yeah, what a good ahead. problem to have where, where <laughs> you just, you don't know where to stick the hit, you know, it's uh do you do it for your band, for your solo album? You know, it's uh, what a, 
What a what a high class problem. It's sort of how hot he became. Uh, he, he was able to choose some of the elements of like which ideas were going to be solo and which riffs might go to a Genesis jam session. There's two other songs that did not make face value, both with interesting stories. Please Don't Ask was a song that Phil had written, a, a very heartfelt song, clearly about his divorce, and decided to instead take it to Genesis. It ended up on Duke, and it, it is an absolute Genesis fan favorite. Um, not a hit by any means, but Duke is a very beloved album for Genesis fans. And please don't ask is one of those album tracks that people just love. The other one is against all odds and Phil had written it and the, the lyrics were not done. It wasn't called against all odds, but he, he honestly didn't think it was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. That song sucks. <laughs> no, I mean, that song's incredible, obviously. So against all odds, misunderstanding and please don't ask all written for this first batch that became face value, but none of them made the album. And just think about what, you know, if, if against all odds was on face value, just adding to a pretty extraordinary album. So, so those were three things that are also sort of in the canon of this album, even though, you know, they clearly did not make the album was man on the corner part of that too. Man on the Corner uh, was on Abacab, mm-hmm. and I don't know exactly when it was written. Which was only, Abacab was only a year after Face Value. So, I mean, exactly. you had Duke, Face Value, and Abacab, you know, bang, bang, bang. It, it sure sounds like it was something written during this phase, and it utilizes the, the drum box and the things that, that Phil was using as a writing tool. So, I don't know exactly when, but it's certainly, Duke, Face Value, and Abacab are kind of all you know, grouped together in a way. If you think about those three albums all came out in less than three years. It's pretty impressive output. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and um, the two songs you mentioned and man on the corner were all, those were the songs that were on Duke and Abacab that were solely credited to Phil, you know, clearly he was taking some of the work and um, placing it onto the Genesis records pretty selfless move if you think about it but genesis always was important to him you know he never until much later in the mid 90s when he actually left the band officially genesis always held still uh i wouldn't say a priority necessarily but certainly up there with his solo career in terms of the things that were important to him musically the other thing too is phil was also playing in this time in a band called brand x which was a jazz jazz fusion band so important to remember Phil's a drummer and always saw himself as a drummer. He really never saw himself as a singer. He reluctantly became the singer of Genesis and brand X was an important outlet for him. And you can hear some of those, uh, some of those kind of brand X fusion things come through on this album as well. So with that, let's get into the wonder stories. I want to know how you really got into Phil. So let's go wonder stories. So like many children in the 80s, I, I kind of I kind of went in reverse with Phil Collins going from the mid 80s back all the way to the beginnings of Genesis. But certainly my earliest recollections of Phil would be Invisible Touch with Genesis, but with him solo would be No Jacket Required, Susudio and Take Me Home and kind of that era. And I don't recall whether it was MTV or radio, but, but he was sort of all over the place. 1985 was that year where you, like, you couldn't get away from Phil Collins. He put out a huge album with No Jacket Required. He did that crazy Live Aid thing where he played a set in, was he played in America first and then for the UK or whichever, or no, he played in the UK first. He played at Wembley got in the Concord, flew to New York, got in a helicopter, flew to Philadelphia, and then played a set at the Live Aid in the States. So he played two continents in one day. It's that infamous thing where he called into MTV or called into Live Aid or whatever it was from the Concord and you couldn't hear him. And it was like a disastrous moment because the, you know, he's flying supersonic 
uh, way, way up in the sky. I don't know why they expected they could do an interview with him during that, <laughs> but he, he did that. And, and certainly there was probably an over saturation of Phil during that time. And that's what I remember is, I mean, he was just everywhere, but then you backtrack and you start to go back to his early solo career and you certainly start to get into early Genesis and you learn that he was not even the original drummer of Genesis and then became the drummer and, and then sort of reluctantly became the singer and his solo career was just this big accident. It's, it's really incredible when you think about that, how, just how huge he became and how much he connected with people through his music and never intended to even be a singer. But those are some of my early memories of, of Phil is just kind of the studio and, and no jacket required. I, I always remember the, the sleeve of that with just Phil's big old head, big old sweaty head, you know, an orange light on the cover red of that face. album. Red, yeah. Big old red face. So, you know, and, and the Phil story really took me into a, a love of Genesis and they became my all-time favorite band. So what's your wonder story with Phil? Well, you know, growing up, it was really Genesis and it was really that invisible touch. What's the album with no, with no son of mine on it? Oh, uh, we can't dance. We can't dance. Yeah. So you know, it was really that pop kind of period of of Genesis, and you kind of got in. At least you know, from my standpoint, you kind of got into the singles a bit. But I wasn't like listening to Domino or anything like like I am now. And then Phil's solo thing, you know, when we were younger, you know, there were a lot of ballads. It, it, in a lot of ways, it was kind of adult contemporary, you know, old people music. And part of that was, you know, I wasn't popping in face value and listening to it top to bottom or, or really visiting any of his work as a whole. It was more the stuff you'd hear on the radio and the Phil stuff you were hearing on the radio more often than not was on the top 40 adult contemporary piece. So certainly a late bloomer on, on Phil solo. And then obviously on the early Genesis work, even post Peter Gabriel before face value, you know, I wasn't really, I mean, you were listening to that stuff when you were 12, you know, I wasn't really appreciating that until much later. I will say um, <laughs> the first day of college, um, which would have been 1998, when I, when I got there and, you know, your parents leave and you're kind of sitting there with your roommate and, you know, realizing that this is going to be your life. And the first thing, my first roommate in college popped into the CD player was Serious Hits Live. And it, it kind of uh, put me at ease a little bit. You know, it was a, I was like, okay, this is cool. You know, I got a roommate that likes Phil Collins. Nice. And that's a really good collection too. I mean, that gives you that, that live edge on a, a lot of these songs that were pretty highly produced and in some cases pretty highly overplayed. And I remember really enjoying listening to some of those songs on serious hits live, particularly one, the ones where he's drumming through the years, you start revisiting early Genesis, you start listening to the whole body of work on later Genesis, you start gaining an understanding, which is part of what this episode's all about of, of his solo work. And look, I just, I love everything about Phil Collins. You know, you talk about a voice. I mean, when he sings live, I don't know if I've ever heard him miss a note. He sounds incredible. He sounds just like he does in the albums. I always thought his voice was very processed. And then you listen to him live and you realize it's not. That's just how good his voice is. You know, he never took himself too seriously. He's always pretty self-deprecating. He's always very transparent. And, you know, he's one of those rare instances where I always really cared about lyrically what he had to say. That guy wrote some great lyrics. Yeah, he did. And really, really good, good stuff that's worth listening to. And the last thing is just such a damn good drummer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he is, Phil Collins is a true athlete behind the drums as far as how hard he can play, how much groove he can play with, you know, but also have the kind of touch that he does. I mean, you mentioned Brand X. I mean, that's not 
you know, that's pretty intricate touch bass, jazz bass drumming. I mean, that guy could sit behind the drums and do whatever the hell he wants and, and make it look pretty easy. I mean, just a, just a ferocious athlete on the drums. He and, you know, the Jeff Percaro and Neil Pert and a few others are just the type of guys that you could just sit there and watch drum for hours. Phil's a, a top 10 drummer of all time. No doubt in my mind. For me personally, he's, he's top three. One of the most underrated thing in, in drumming is tone. Everyone always talks about tone in terms of guitar and bass and what's your tone, man? And how do you get your tone? Drummers strive for tone as well. And Phil's got one of the most identifiable tones in the history of drumming. And a lot of that is, is Hugh Padgham uh, and, and the, the sound that they were able to get on record through that gated drum sound, which we'll talk more about, was really quintessential for its time. It, pretty much everything Phil's ever done has turned gold. I mean, Phil had a bad way in the mid nineties through eh, maybe the mid to late two thousands, you know, the, the both sides, I know it's an album he loves, but it, it, it's a dreary album that nobody I'm convinced nobody really likes listening to dance it to the light <laughs> was terrible. Testify was, was the worst album he's made. So, you know, he didn't bat a thousand and, you know, even on the first few solo albums, there, there are some things that you say, oh gosh, what, what was he thinking on that? But there was, there was an a, a eclecticism to the first few albums that is very unique that didn't last. By the time he started making hits and then he really got into love songs. And then by the end, he was, he was like a Disney guy you know, the, the Tarzan stuff and the big brother. And he, he worked on the Broadway shows for those productions. And that was good material, but, but that's kind of what he became, you know, he kind of became the, 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 the Disney guy and the love song guy. And when you listen to face value, you realize just how raw the whole thing was early on and, and how experimental Phil was. He's a very experimental musician. I mean, he was not, he was not uh, certainly not, not out trying to write a hit by any means with face value. And that's one of the things that makes the album really special is it, is it did in turn then have hits. Agreed. I, and you know, it could be argued that, and we'll see at the end of this episode, but it could be argued that Phil never made a fantastic album uh, solo wise. It could very well be argued to your point. There, there were some clunkers, and even within, you know, his good albums, you know, there are probably moments that are for some more than others. In digging into face value, I kind of did it wrong at the beginning, quite honestly. I think in order to really give a proper assessment of this, of this record, you have to do a couple of things that I wasn't doing at first. You got to forget that it's Phil, you know, the, the legend who went on to solo greatness and has had won Grammys and did Disney soundtracks and, you know, the Phil that we all know and love today, you got to put that aside and realize that this is Phil literally taking the first crack at trying to find his way as a solo artist. And the second thing you got to remember, it's 1981. This is 40 years ago. So, you know, at first I was kind of listening to this album, trying to, relate it to the Phil that we've all grown to love, but remembering that this was not a polished solo artist at this point, And this was really his first crack at work. And like you said, from the onset, a little bit of a happy accident type record. So when you put those things into the context, you listen to it a little, a little bit differently. And that was kind of my experience with digging back into this album. Let's dig into it right now. And I think we should drop that needle. When you drop the needle on face value, the first thing you hear is the Roland CR78. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what the Roland CR78 is, T? I believe it's a drum machine. It is a very early primitive drum machine. And what you hear is in the air tonight. Mm -hmm. 
So the Roland CR78 is where it all begins. Being a drummer to make demos, he wasn't able to like lay down drum tracks and then do things on top of it. He literally just was experimenting with this drum box. And he says that one of the early beats that he came up with was that right there. And most people say, you know, why would a drummer use a drum machine? Well, there, there's a lot of different reasons for it. Number one, you know, it gives him a base that he can do some writing on top of. But Phil always said that he loved kind of the relentlessness of a drum machine. The fact that it just never quits. And this pattern, this atmosphere is what gave this song its message. It's funny. People spe have speculated about the lyrics of In the Air Tonight for decades. Uh, I've heard people have written like um, research papers and, and uh, doctoral theses on, on the lyrics of this song. And, and Phil will tell you the lyrics were just a reflection of that drum beat. It, it created a mood and all he could think about is, you know, in the air tonight. And that was just the phrase that the, the song was worked around. But remember, this is a divorce album. So Phil will say that one line in it when he says, if you told me you were drowning, I would not lend a hand. Yeah, that's at his ex-wife. He, he has confirmed that. Phil's pissed, man. Ouch. Phil's pissed. You know, every once in a while, Phil just gets pissed. You know, you can hear it in his, in his singing. And I kind of like it. I like it when he gets real pissed. Oh, I love when Phil gets riled up. You know, that's when he really, uh, he, he gets into that register of kind of gritty tone in his voice. And uh, yeah, love when, love when Phil gets pissed. There's, there's two things about this album that stand out. Simplicity and space. One of the things you, you learn when you listen to Face Valley, Phil was into space. Very, very much so. But the album is so simple. And this song is just incredibly simple. It's a great example of why most hit singles are, in their essence, really, really simple compositions. Amit Erdogan, who's like the legend of Atlantic Records, he's like the dude who basically built Atlantic Records. He apparently, if artists were struggling in their careers at Atlantic, he, Amit er Erdogan used to bring them in and play them in the air tonight and say, this is a hit record. Just listen to how simple it is, how basic it is. Cause the chord progression is, 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 it sounds like a guy who's just trying to figure out how to write a song. I mean, there's nothing complex about it, but when you combine it with that relentlessness of the drum box and, and his vocal just comes in and I mean, it, it just creates an atmosphere that I don't think a whole lot of people heard in 1981. Yeah. You know, I, I realized how much I loved Phil when, uh, he was talking about the drum beat and then he just started kind of fiddling with a progression over the drum beat. And it starts with a D minor and he dropped the uh, spinal tap line that uh, it's the saddest of all notes. <laughs> and I mean, Phil Collins dropping spinal tap. I mean, that's, that shows you what, what we're dealing with here. It's pretty, pretty, good. pretty, pretty awesome dude. But yeah, I mean, look, this song is, um, this song is legendary. There are very, very few songs out there in any genre that truly can fit any mood. I mean, you can listen to In the Air Tonight when you're sad. You can listen to it when you're pissed off. You can listen to it when you're sleepy. You can listen to it when you're fired up, like when you're trying to get pumped for a game or a business presentation or whatever you're trying to get amped up for. You know, you can listen to it when you're excited. I've seen it on on sports highlight uh, reels. You know, you can listen to it when you're trying to get rowdy, especially that that drum part. I mean, it is it is a song that just can fit any mood, any frame of mind, and enhance it. And there are very very few songs like that, and that's all created through atmosphere. And, it's great perspective. Uh, yeah, songs like this. Uh, and I think it's to your point about the um, the record executive. Um, songs like this just, they don't come around a lot. You know, they don't come around often and they're timeless. And to kick off your first solo record with a song like In the Air Tonight um, and how iconic it's become is pretty tremendous. You almost could just stop the album review there. <laughs> but I guess we probably shouldn't do that. It would make for a really short podcast, you know, 
I also thought it was interesting that uh, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the Genesis expert here, but he took Rutherford and Banks through this song and they kind of said, eh, it's pretty good, Phil, but you know, but I was thinking about this and then going on to something else that made it on Duke. And he kind of felt it was too simple, you know, kind of to your point about the simplicity of the track. I don't know if it was Phil that felt this way or um, Banks and Rutherford that felt this way, but, but ultimately it was decided that this track was too simple to be on Duke and to think that anybody would hear the song and not be, you know, absolutely gushing to have it on their record is kind of interesting. It's controversial because Tony Banks actually now says that Phil never played him in the air tonight. <laughs> and Phil says, of course I played him in the air tonight. And it, I, I kind of believe Phil on this one because he was taking all of his ideas to Genesis during this time. I mean, he, again, he wasn't out to record a solo album. So I believe Phil, but Tony Banks swears that Phil did not play him in the air tonight, that he, that he just held it for himself. But which is, what's interesting about that too is a, a couple years later, Genesis did their self-titled album, the one with the shapes on it. And the opening track on that album is a song called Mama. And Mama is eerily similar to In the Air Tonight. It, it's got a, a drum box beat. It, it all crashes in about halfway through the song. Big drum backbeat with the gated drum sound real anthemic vocal on top of it. I mean, Mama is like Genesis version of In the Air Tonight. And so Tony Banks at some point must have said, oh, simplicity might be okay. You know, and really the more simple Genesis ended up getting, the more popular they got. It, it, let me ask you this. I, I, is When the drums crash in, which Phil refers to as, he, he says that that is the symbolism there is he's losing his temper uh, over his divorce. He calls it the losing your temper entrance is that the most famous drum fill of all time and there were only two other ones that i came up with and i think this would be the mount rushmore of drum fills it'd be in the air tonight it'd be bob o'reilly by the who if you look at the the first minute and a half of bob o'reilly and the way that keith moon enters the song and the fills that he does and it'd be rush's tom sawyer um i mean maybe wipe out (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Why, maybe Wipeout's the fourth head on that, on that Mount Rushmore. No, I, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, this is, um, it's rare for a drum fill or a drum intro or a drum solo to be this iconic. That's a drum fill that, you know, kids, teenagers, college kids, adults, probably even some elderly grandmas and grandpas out there have probably air drummed this beat before. And um, that doesn't happen very often. I would like right now, if you're okay with it, I'd like to challenge you to a verbal drum off. Okay. So you go first, give me your best verbal representation of that drum fill. Cause okay. everybody's got one. Everybody, any musician from the last 40 years has at some point verbal that drum fill. So let's hear yours and then we'll hear mine and then we'll have a little, we'll just, this will be our verbal drum off. The last line is some stranger to you and me. Is that right? Yeah. Some stranger. Okay. So here you want me to sing, you want me to sing the last line and then you do the drum fill. Would that be helpful? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay, here we go. Some stranger to you and me. God. God. Can I, I, can I stop? It's pretty good. I'll, I'll keep going. I'll do the whole, I'll do the whole damn song. That was good. That was right. good. I think right, that was pretty good. You know, you're the drummer. I don't know if we, I don't know if we've said this on the podcast officially, but, but Nubs is a drummer, full, a fully accomplished drummer. Like he can actually play. So let's hear how you do okay, it. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Some stranger to you and me. You went more in the ga ga ga. You either do the da da or the gaga. You went with the da da with the gaga. Interesting. Like a radio radio gaga. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Name me a drummer that hasn't once 
done what we just did. That was good. I, I, I wonder whose was better, honestly. It was a verbal drum battle. We'll see. I'll tell you the best one of all was Phil's. His was better than both of ours. I mean, I've seen him do it, you know, just messing around on just clips. And <laughs> I mean, even just watching him play that, he's got like eight toms around him, but it just even just watching him play that Phil, it's like no one else can play that the way he does. No one. <laughs> You know, anyone who likes In the Air Tonight should should go on YouTube and watch some live performances of it because the song really developed over time. The live version took on a whole new dynamic. Uh, it, there's even a keyboard melody that Phil at some point added to the live version near the end of the song. That's a really pretty keyboard me- melody that went along with the vocal and um, added this whole new element. And he started singing it a little bit differently live, you know, just gave it even more grit. And then the way the song ended, it actually, you know, ended on the one, which was really cool. So live the song, and you and I, I I know I saw Phil a couple of times. I think you, I think you went and saw him at least once, didn't you? Uh, Once solo and then twice with with Genesis. With Genesis. Um, in the air tonight live is a real experience. It is. I mean, it really is. And and it was always the centerpiece of the, of the Phil solo show. No question. Well, from the, the glory of in the air tonight, the simplicity, then we get into the space. This must be love. We must be love. So it's a divorce album, but this, this song's about, this is about the new chick. Oh. So by the time he was writing, he had already, you know, found himself a new lady friend. And this is the one song in the album that, that kind of expresses that sentiment versus just being pissed off about being divorced. But this is that spaciness. You know, this is, this is again atmosphere, but in a different way. So this is a this is a rebound song, basically. It's a rebound song. Phil's rebound. Wow. Um, I think this song's boring. Um, you know, sometimes when Phil got a little too lovey dovey, it, it, it he'd lose me. You know, one more night, groovy kind of love, that kind of stuff. It you know. It's, it's, I, you know, some of the things he was doing, I felt like were just so targeted toward adult contemporary radio, which is fine. You know, you gotta, you gotta make your bucks. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta move the units. But, um, but then again, I mean, I l- listen, I Phil's, I mean, against all odds is incredible. Take me home. I mean, you know, I got nothing against a good old fashioned Phil ballad, but some of, some of these, um, you know, these ones that are just so driven by synthesizers and electronics and where he starts singing real soft and everything is, uh, sometimes he loses me a little. What, what saves the song is a, a really outstanding bass part by Alfonso Johnson. You know, he's playing a fretless bass and it, it really carries the song. Cause you're right. It's a song that doesn't do a whole lot except for that bass line. That bass line is, is killer. Agreed. Well, there's nothing quite like covering your own song, which is what they did next, what he did next with Behind the Lines. And there are the horns. The horns have entered. So Behind the Lines is the opening track on the Genesis album Duke, which remember, you know, was coming out right around the same time as this album. So I I don't know if it's props to Phil for being bold enough to sort of cover your own song (laughs) or if it's completely and utterly ridiculous that he covered a Genesis song on his first solo album. But the story behind it is that when they were mixing Duke, they were mixing behind the lines. And at some point they sped the tape up to get to a certain spot. 
And when they played the song in fast speed, Phil heard a totally different song and said, Oh, we should take behind the lines and do like a, like a sort of R and B version of it and put horns on it. So on one hand, it's kind of a clever take on his own song. And on the other hand, I've never quite understood why would you cover your own song that basically came out the same year? Yeah. It, you know, it's a cool, you know, quintessential fill tune, uh, upbeat, but you know, the, the horn section I think is really what stands out. And certainly you see it throughout the remainder of the album. And I thought it was interesting. I bet working with the studio with him in the studio is a trip because, you know, you've heard about Sue studio where basically that was just him kind of muttering along with, you know, trying to come up with a vocal part and he was verbalizing certain things that he thought fit with the music. And it turned out to be something that makes no sense, but they kept it. And it was just him kind of playing around and on in the air tonight, he just kind of came up with those words based on the drum beat. He, he seemed to play a lot. And my understanding is with the horn section that he would bring in, uh, you know, these, some of the best horn players in the world. And he would say, okay, I want you to go, but and then they kind of do it. You know, I mean, yeah. he was obviously a very um, creative guy, but not from the standpoint of every, you know, you walk in and everything's on sheet music. I'm sure it was more in the sort of vein of, you know, I want it to be something like this, but not like this, but more like this, but beta, beta, beta. And then, you know, you got these professional musicians that are, kind of looking at each other like, all right, I guess that's what Phil wants. Let's do it. You know, some of, there are moments in this album where it gets a little horn happy, but you know, it probably gave him a lot of confidence. This was again, his first time working through the studio as a solo artist and to be able to convey some of these things that he was looking for. And, you know, he certainly seemed satisfied with, uh, with that element of the record and the musicians who contributed toward it. And it probably, you know, gave him a lot of confidence and gave him a lot of creativity. He certainly took a lot of shit for the horns throughout his career, um, especially when he sort of brought them into the Genesis world because no reply at all, which became a Genesis hit, has the earth, wind and fire horns on it. But clearly when he set out to do this, the, bringing in those guys was a priority and they were very established to your point, very established musicians. Um, and for him to bring them in, you know, certainly I think reflects his sort of R, his love of R and B. If you really look at Phil's influences, he was a huge Motown fan and, and kind of early R and B singles and things like that is really what he was raised on as a, as a boy in England. Uh, so he's letting those influences come out and it creates a, a really eccentric, interesting sound, but was also kind of controversial. You know, there were, there were, if you can believe it, there were radio stations uh, in the U S that wouldn't play his music because they thought that it was more of like an R and B thing, you know, and didn't belong on, on pop and rock radio and vice versa. You know, there were R and B stations that wouldn't play his stuff where uh, it might've belonged on it. And so he, he's, he's always a little bit hard to categorize, but the horns, we're not without their controversy, but they did bring a trademark to his sound. I prefer the Genesis version of behind the lines much more than this version. I, I think behind the lines is a tremendous opener on Duke. And this is just kind of a cute take on it to me. His solo work was very influenced by black music. He, he was clearly very influenced by R and B and Motown um, and you can see that really come through in a, in a lot of his work throughout, not, not just on this record, but throughout his entire solo album. So it, a really interesting, you know, balance of, of somebody who's heavily influenced by horns, Motown, black music, um, and probably was growing up. You know, it seems like that kind of music coming out of America is something that always really fascinated him. And he, you could tell he really wanted to incorporate, but then a guy who loved Brian Eno as well, you know? And, and I think sometimes where you get into this sort of hodgepodge of Phil and at times where you could 
claimed that some of his um, solo work had a hard time finding direction probably had to do with this real variety and, and true diversity of influences that in many cases you can tell, you know, we're all important to him to try and incorporate. Next is The Roof is Leaking. Sort of uh, what it sounds like when an English drummer tries to write a country song. I, I, think, I think this is an amazing composition. Um, so much atmosphere. Again, space, space, space. He, he, he clearly had a love of music with wide open space in it. And of course, this is the song that, that features Eric Clapton on it. But it's interesting because Clapton came in and Phil, I, I, as part of this, I finally read Phil's memoir, his autobiography, which, which is an absolutely incredible book. I recommend it to anybody. He's, he's so candid in it, but he talks a lot about his friendship with Eric Clapton and, and they were big drinking buddies. And apparently when, when Eric Clapton came over to record this, they got together and had a few, uh, had a few beverages and Clapton came in to play some slide guitar and I think a little bit of steel guitar and laid down a few different ideas and, and Phil didn't really like most of them. In fact, they only used a really small slide guitar part from Eric Clapton for this session. And, and part of it, I've heard the tapes of what Clapton originally played and it's very busy. And you could tell that what Phil's going for here is, is something really spacey and really straightforward. Yeah, I really like the way side A closes out and, and it's atmospheric, you know, and, and it starts with the roof is leaking. So, you know, I, I almost kind of see those three as um, a collective in a way. I'm not sure if that's what he was intending, but takes you through a lot of different moods, a lot of different directions. And I think this is kind of the, I see this as sort of the beginning of closing up that that first side. And I think it's really clever the way the three different tracks do so and, and sort of kicked off by this fairly, you know, dreary, you know, pretty atmospheric track and, and the roof is leaking. I really like it. It is like a trilogy. No question about it. I, I don't think you can listen to the roof is leaking without them going into the next two. And it does bring side a to a really interesting end. And, and even Genesis was doing things in threes at this point as well. A lot of progressive rock does that, you know, the, the first three songs on Duke are all combined. And so clearly there's this idea of threes that has followed him in the band through a lot of different areas of their career. And th I think this is a strong series of three, which leads into Droned. little bit of an in the air tonight reprise there isn't it? it is a little bit yeah with that uh that backing keyboard part and later you get that uh that that vocal i don't even know what style you would call it but it's al shankar who's doing it who's an extraordinary musician himself and phil brought him in just kind of said hey do something and he kind of does those chanty vocals later in the song and again just experimental it's on one hand you've got some commercial things here and we'll get into some of that certainly with side two, but this is a very experimental piece. And again, I, you just keep thinking about brand X, you know, brand X is this experimental fusion band that Phil's playing drums in during this time. And, and drone really sounds like it's something really off of a brand X album. Yeah. I feel like droned is where, you know, Phil reminds us that, you know, he's, he's still part of a progressive rock operation you know because this is again continued atmosphere you know continued blending of many different elements at once and I, you know i wouldn't say it's complicated or complex but 
you know, I, I think if Phil just came out of nowhere and was never part of Genesis, tracks like this wouldn't probably end up on his solo work. So it, it's a very good bridge between the roof is leaking and and the instrumental that closes out the side. Yep, and then and then he reminds us all of his chops as a drummer with hand in hand. You kind of hear that drum box deep in the mix. I don't know if you can pull it out, but it's it's running through the the song. You can kind of get you kind of get the vibe here that Phil's ready to have fun. You know, during at his solo shows and even at Genesis shows, he spends a lot of time out front singing. But you can just see when he gets the chance to run back there and play drums with Chester Thompson, he like lights up you know you could tell he just lives for running back there and doing what he does and hand in hand gave him that chance live it's a great instrumental oh fantastic i almost feel like he kind of um, reached back for some of these elements when he did dance into the light which was a huge single however many years later 20 years 25 years later like i said the the three tracks there i i do think all kind of work together um, as a trio and, um, you know, closed out by a great instrumental with great drumming. And you're right. I mean, watching him, you know, some people are just so natural on their instrument and, and, you know, there, there really aren't a ton of, of rock musicians and certainly rock drummers that are able to be as effortless and as powerful like you said earlier, just pull up a clip and watch him, you know, watch him in a studio space or, or in a live performance. I mean, it's, it's impressive. And, and this song does really showcase that. The side one concludes there and it, it, what an adventurous side of music from a first time solo artist um, from in the air tonight to hand in hand is many would consider that to be one of the great sides uh, in, in, in albums. And certainly if you just look at the, the whole Genesis canon and all the solo albums and all the music that's come out of all the members of Genesis side, one of face value is certainly heralded as, as one of the great sides, a side of an album that you just wouldn't see anymore in terms of just how musically diverse it is and how all over the map it is. It's a pretty special side of music. So we flip the, the album and we go to side B and we kick it off with I Missed Again. So when he first started writing the song and, and he kind of, he still had warm feelings about his ex-wife. The song was I Miss You Babe. So the early demos of the song is he's singing, singing, I miss you, babe. And then um, probably after she took half of his net worth, the song took a totally different tone and he, and he changed it to, I missed again. He didn't miss her anymore or she wasn't babe anymore either. <laughs> no. Yeah. He probably just missed everything that she took from him. Does it get more Motown than that drum intro though? No, it's that, that famous Phil, right? Completely. And he nails I, it. He does. You know, I Missed Again was supposed to be the hit. That's what's interesting about this album is, is many thought that that was the single that was going to be the one that kind of put the album on the map. I don't think anybody guessed that In the Air Tonight, as unconventional as it is, would become the largest hit, but I missed again, clearly was going for, a, it's a very commercial sounding song with great catchiness and the horns. This is the one with the music video, pretty famous video where it's a split screen of like seven fills and each, each one is playing a different instrument. Air instrument. Air instrument. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, uh, very famous video and, and very self deprecating and, Phil kind of clowning around and doing what he does. And I think that's always been part of his appeal is um, 
he could be very heartfelt. He could be very transparent. He could be very deep, but he never took himself too seriously. And he never let an extraordinary amount of fame kind of change his approach or change his attitude or change his personality. And uh, he's the first to always poke fun at himself or goof around or, you know, things that you just didn't see artists that were as successful as he was do very often. And I think it was always part of his charm and part of his appeal. It's such a unique career. I mean, nobody has ever kind of taken the track that he took. What a lot of people don't realize, uh, his very beginnings were in drama school. He was, he was a young child actor. Um, he actually was in a couple productions. So theater was kind of his jam uh, early on in his life. And I think he always saw himself as becoming involved in acting. And later, ironically, he did. You know, he starred in Buster and he was in Miami Vice and he's he's made all these cameos in, in different TV shows and movies and things like that. But I think he's always brought a theatricality to what he does, but in a really personable way. And, and, and it's funny, you know, he... T- there's a lot of people, I would say it's pretty short-sighted, but there's a lot of people that criticize his album sleeves. You know, they say, well, he puts a picture of himself and on every album cover and, and they're missing out on the humor of it. Yeah. I think, I think Phil Collins was, was the uh, first person to realize that he probably wasn't the guy up on, uh, you know, the, the, the teenage girls um, poster up on their wall. Um, I think Phil knew that. So <laughs> anyone trying to claim that, uh, you know, Phil was out there trying to, uh, you know, pose as some kind of um, model or, or uh, teen idol or, or, or make it about his grandioseness as a uh, polished, postured rock star doesn't know anything about Phil Collins because, you know, he, he was as self-deprecating as anybody still is. That's part of the beauty of Phil. He was never trying to to be on a poster on your wall. He was trying to express himself and do so in a way that was easy to understand and easy to absorb. I think he did a decent job seeing that he's been a successful music artist for like 50 years now. Are you telling me he's not a sex symbol? You probably had his poster <laughs> on your wall. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, you know what I mean? A couple love songs inside too. Um, Phil's a good piano player. A lot of people don't realize that. He, he plays piano live on a lot of his songs and wrote a number of songs on piano. And like this song's based around a a pretty gorgeous opening piano bit. Uh, but you definitely do see kind of in the second side, him going towards that, you know, kind of some of the more tender aspects of his songwriting. It's a nice song. It is a nice song. I, again, I, I kind of mentioned it from the onset, but Phil's voice, it's just incredible to think that at one point he was sitting behind a drum kit and, you know, it would have been very easy in the trajectory of his career for him to never sing in a band. You know, he could have been a session drummer. He could have, Peter Gabriel could have stayed with Genesis forever. He could have gone to a different band and, you know, played drums or played, I mean, he's probably the type of dude that could play a lot of different stuff. And I think we're, we're lucky that he found literally found his voice and had that opportunity because especially nowadays, not to sound like an old man, but you just have so many artists out there that just can't sing, you know, and it's so produced in the studio and in DIY, you're able to go back and cut and paste and fix your mistakes and all. I mean, singers like, like that are uh, getting to be less and less. And um, you know what I mean? It's just yet another great showcase of that, but Hearing Phil sing live is, and and as the years have gone out, obviously he's had to, you know, take the key down on some songs and, 
you know, as he's dealt with his health issues and that sort of thing. But, you know, I'll tell you on a, on the right night, uh, doing the right song. Um, Phil Collins has as great of a live voice as anybody out there. Yeah. It's a great vocal performance for sure. Thunder and lightning. Okay, now he's just ripping off Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like, hey, I've got, I've got the horn players in here. I might as well do a song that just blatantly sounds like EWF. Yep, there are those horns again. Big fat groove, though. Yeah, definitely. You can, you can really, um, you can really hear his drumming in there. The, uh, the, the horn players have some pretty interesting uh, reflections on working with Phil. Most of them didn't know who he was, but by the end of the recording, I think they knew that this was going somewhere and then they, they toured with him and really became part of, of the whole band and the whole Phil thing as he went solo. So yeah, I think it's, it's cool part of second side to have the horns prominent on I missed again. And then they come back in pretty full effect here on thunder and lightning. It's definitely a big chunky groove. I, I I dig listening to it, and it just furthers that whole kind of R and B sense. But but boy, is he ripping off Earth, Wind, and Fire here. I mean, it really sounds like if you just musically, it like sounds like something off one of those early '80s EWF albums. It really does. Yeah, again, another nod to um, you know R and B and incorporating that into into this album. Um, and this track's a prime example. All right, how about this for a divorce album title? I'm not moving. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a divorce song, does it? He was pretty good at rapping, you know, serious lyrics into fun music you know yes. he, he kind of made that a trademark of his of his solo work he could take some really pretty heartfelt and in some cases somber lyrics and package them into something that was really radio friendly and bouncy and i do like the bounciness uh, of this song that's a nice piano riff it, it kind of again we talked about it in the air tonight kind of precursors is a precursor to mama by genesis this kind of reminds me of uh, kind of r r reminds me of that's all, you know, with that kind of piano bit and that kind of bouncy drum thing going on. And he did do that a lot. You know, he, there, he, he could write a toe tapper and then you kind of dig into it. I, I had a, I had a friend in college who had a rather nasty breakup with, uh, with, with a young gal and, he decided it'd be a good idea to make her, you know, most people make your existing girlfriend, a mixtape with a bunch of happy songs on it, you know? And he thought it'd be a nice idea to make her a breakup tape with a bunch of kind of F you songs on it. And one of them was throwing it all away. And I was like, well, that's a pretty, snappy poppy happy so why why the hell you put that one on there and then i read the lyrics it was like whoa yeah that's not that's not poppy or snappy uh um, yeah at all so yeah phil phil did have a, a knack for you know and again i think it's part of why lyrically he's he's one of the better artists because very transparent very honest very upfront wasn't a lot of beating around the bush with, you know, kind of what he was ever trying to say. And he was that way all the time. You know, you look at interviews and you look at him discussing his career though. I mean, it kind of is what it is. You, you just, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get the straight scoop and you're going to get humility and you're going to get self-deprecation. And you know, I think all those things come through uh, lyrically, regardless of sometimes how, 
pop sensible or not the uh, the tune might be. It certainly continues that simplicity in space. And this uh, I'm Not Moving would fall into the simplicity category. It's just based around kind of a bouncing piano riff and poppy, fun vocal line. And it's a cool song. But he's singing higher and higher as the album goes on. And If Leaving Me Is Easy is certainly an example of that, especially near the end. So th- this is a song that a lot of Phil fans love. It, it, it's one of my least favorites. It sort of never ends. <laughs> it, it's very, if it's, it's painfully sort of melancholic and the ending has this vocal loop where he's singing. It's incredibly high register and it's, it, it, it just sounds, you know, it's, it's just very hard to listen to. And I think that those who make fun of Phil Collins, if leaving me as easy is, is like ripe for, for those who hate him, uh, especially his sort of love song era. This is, I, I, I always, anytime I listen to the album, just cannot wait for this one to get done and get to the, the way it closes. It, it just represents everything that he did later in his career that I couldn't stand. I would concur. Not, not a fan. Um, I think it's dull. And uh, I don't know, maybe he was, he was just trying to bring down the mood before the, uh, the close or cover song. But um, yeah, th- these are, these are the type of moments where, uh, like I kind of said earlier, you could make the case that, that Phil never made a fantastic album. And Probably, you know, too many albums of his had too many moments like this. He ends with a cover, which I don't know if how uh, terribly common that is, but we'll dig into this a little bit. Tomorrow Never Knows. Who did that song originally again? Um, I think it was this band from England. I don't know. Four guys. They didn't, they weren't that good. Covering the Beatles is an interesting thing. I, I'd love to know where this ranks on your, on your list of, of Beatles covers. It takes a lot to, to take on the Fab Four. I think contextually you have to remember that. John Lennon was killed in December of 80 and this album came out in February of 81. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, Phil said, I want to cover this song as sort of a tribute. And, um, you, you can never forget Phil's still an experimental guy. You know, he's still, a he's still a guy who's willing to take some risks and he knows atmosphere and in this case, he kind of shows his like psychedelic side in a lot of ways. But, but what, what do you think of covering the Beatles and, and where would this particular interpretation rank amongst your kind of favorite Beatles covers? I, you know, I think it's a nice take on it. I mean, it's a Tomorrow Never Knows was a obviously I'm a big revolver guy when it comes to the Beatles and obviously this was the closing track on revolver as it's the closing track on face value. And, you know, it was a very innovative song with a drum loop with a lot of backtracking back masking of tracks and, and voices and effects that were played backwards on the track to kind of gain that psychedelic effect, obviously a very John Lennon driven song. And, uh, and that's, that's a good point by you. I didn't even put that together that this was, you know, so soon afterwards. So, you know, I, I do think that um, covering the Beatles is, is difficult. You know, a few that 
come to mind for me. I mean, I love the um, Jerry Garcia band's version of Dear Prudence, which is like 14 minutes long, but it's just so good. It never ends, but it is so good. (laughs) It goes on a while, but yeah, you know, I think that for the most part, it's a it's a lofty task to do so, and especially on a track that was so experimental. But I like what he does to it. You know, it's kind of slowed down. It's a, it's a nice choice of a of a song to offer a take on of one that certainly was so influenced and in, and in, and in really composed primarily by John. And it's a it's a nice way to end an album, and in this case, your first album. You know, Phil Phil was very nicely influenced and very widely, diversely influenced. You know, for him to use the last track on his first record to pay homage in that way, I think is pretty cool. He definitely brings something unique out of the song by slowing it down. You know, the 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 Beatles version on Revolver, like you mentioned, very groundbreaking, but it's just this thunderous almost frantic thing that's going on there. Yeah. And by sort of cutting the song and slowing it down and really bringing out the vocal melody, I think Phil finds something in the song that is even more psychedelic in some cases than the original. And the original is the quintessential psychedelic song. I mean, it almost, it almost kicked off that kind of era of music. I think to end his first solo album with the Beatles cover says a lot in a lot of different ways. And it's a nice tribute to John Lennon just a few months uh, after, after his death. And so it certainly, it, it wraps up one of the more eclectic solo debuts you would ever hear. And to do it with a spaced out Beatles cover is, is pretty fitting. So Toph, does face value matter? Oh, it certainly matters in that, um, you know, it was the initial work of a, of a very important artist, you know? And, and like I said, from the onset, I, I just, I love everything about Phil Collins and I didn't want to say this until after, but I will throw in there except cause I do have an except on this that I, I really don't feel that he ever released a really fantastic top to bottom album. I think he's, you know, written and recorded some extraordinary songs. And through his work with Genesis and his solo work has produced timeless, I mean, truly timeless music. But I can't, you know, really think of an album, including Face Value, that just seems like a necessity. So important in that, it was a very, very important artist's first work. It was a very respectable effort. It has a song on there that probably could probably be Phil Collins' is true, you know, kind of eternal work as a solo artist and in the air tonight. But, you know, I just I just have never felt that there's an album in in Phil's solo catalog that top to bottom is outstanding. And there, there are with Genesis. I mean, you know, even the records around this time, I mean, Duke, Abacab, Invisible Touch. I mean, those albums are outstanding. And and I'm not sure that, that Phil ever made an outstanding album as a solo artist, but yes, it does matter. I agree with you. I don't think he made that quintessential top to bottom, but face value is probably the closest that he came to the most complete work. I would say out of all of his solo albums, it's significant because it kicked off not just one of the most successful solo careers in music history for Phil, but it kicked off uh, the production career for Hugh Padgham, which is very significant. He went on to, to become one of the great producers and work with, some of the best artists, but more than anything, it started a decade where I, I don't think you could find another decade in another single musician who had the level of success that Phil had in the 1980s by himself and with Genesis. If you think about from face value all the way to no jacket required 
And with Genesis, if you're talking about Duke, Abacab, the self-titled album, Invisible Touch. I mean, who else? What one single musician dominated a decade like Phil Collins in the 80s? It just, it's just not out there. And to do that as a drummer who kind of reluctantly became a front man, it just makes for one of the great stories in music history. And, and a lot of it is the, the points that you brought up tonight about Phil just as a person, as an artist. He's very unique. And so it certainly matters because it kicked off a completely unprecedented decade by one artist and one that I would tend to think would never happen again, you know, where one person could legitimately through two different avenues have that much musical output that connects so much with people as his work did with both Genesis and solo. So well, it certainly matters. The, and think about the crossover effect too. I mean, this, this was an artist that, uh, you know, I mean, you could argue that there were a lot that dominated their particular sector of the charts or their particular genre. But, you know, Phil was on rock radio, Phil was on pop radio, Phil was on adult contemporary radio. So, so you know, it, it was very unique to have an artist that could fill that many different, you know, check that many different boxes within the world of radio, which was extremely important at the time. Uh, as well as within the world of MTV, as well as within the world of just selling records at the record store. Um, and he was able to do all those things with multiple bands. So Tuff, give me your final cut. Is face value on the turntable? Is it in the collection? Is it collecting dust? Or is it in the dreaded for sale bin? Where would you put it? So I'm going to put this in the for sale bin. And most of the reason for that is because, I, you know, I feel like you can get the best of Phil. And I, I typically am not really into compilations or best of sets, but I think with Phil Collins solo work, it actually um, is quite appropriate. And, you know, you can get the hits compilation, you can get serious hits live, you can get some of those, um, collections and get just the absolute best of his work. And I never really feel like I'm missing out on some of the more deep cuts from face value or from, you know, his other records. Um, you know, as long as you're capturing um, and not all the songs were top hits, but I think most of what you'd find in a, in a proper Phil Collins solo compilation is kind of what you need and in that case um to actually you know own any of his uh his solo catalog as far as albums go to me just uh seems not necessary for my own personal collection so i'm gonna be uh putting this one in the uh, for sale bin hmm. you're gonna uh you're gonna sell phil well i'm gonna keep the greatest hits but I'm going to sell face value. Hmm. Oh, let me grab a Kleenex. I'm... I know. I know. It's, it's <laughs> tough to take. One. Tough to we're, take. We're going to get through this though. <laughs> For me, it's on the turntable. I, I listen to this album regularly, but mostly side one. Uh, side two is not a side that I visit regularly. Um, I do like I Missed Again. I like Tomorrow Never Knows, but the material in between, it's it just not as strong, but... I, I do think side one of this album is is really incredible and one that I, without question, listen to on a very regular basis. So face value is on the turntable for me, but but I would say side side one, much, much more so than side two. T, what is in your head right now? In your head. <laughs> and once again, uh, what's in your head is where we conclude by looking at three songs, just like we started off the show by talking about the three albums that we're listening to at the moment. Let's check in and T let us know what are the three songs that are on rotation in your playlist right now. In your head, in your head. <laughs> Motion sickness, which is the opening track from hot chips album from a few years back. The album is called In Our Heads. 
from 2012 and motion sickness is the opening track. And this is an outstanding song. I, I'm, I'm not a huge hot chip fan in that. I think that they're often hit or miss, but this is a song with a tremendous intro that builds and builds and builds until it kind of kicks in to the main song. I think it's a, a pretty good electronic outfit in hot chip. I think it's their absolute best and and certainly one of my favorite songs within that um you know i guess you could call it that sort of edm you know electronic uh type uh genre so a very 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 strong opening track from a hot chip album from a few years back the second is a song called it's all right uh, and this is by uh, adam faith i assume this was out in the 60s at some point and I actually fairly recently um, after watching the Ken Burns Vietnam war documentary in its entirety, I, I, you know, had been kind of revisiting a few other dramatic portrayals around the Vietnam war. And one of them was the movie, good morning Vietnam. And there's a really um, great montage um, scene in that movie with, you know, Robin Williams doing a lot of his funny stuff. And this, uh, this song, It's All Right by Adam Faith is, uh, is playing in the background. So it's kind of an old 60s jam, but, uh, but a really cool tune that I've, uh, that I've been listening to a bit as a result of that movie. And then the third is, uh, is from the great Spice One who was kind of one of my favorite early nineties, uh, rappers. He was a West coast guy on the, uh, jive records label and, and off his debut, which is just a great early nineties rap album. Uh, there's a song called uh, money gone that I've, uh, known since I was junior high age and, and still like to listen to particularly during the summer times, a great wah guitar, piece and a, and a really nice, uh, almost kind of black exploitation type of a, uh, groove to it and type of a tune to it with, uh, some really good, uh, rap work being done over that by spice one. So I got a, I got a, uh, two thousands electronic tune, a sixties rocker, and then a, uh, early nineties West coast rap song. So that just kind of sums up my eclectic approach to music. What, uh, what's in your head, Nicholas? Great. Uh, just great spice one call. I would say that's pretty good. Uh, what's in my head right now is uh, a song called cascade by a band called animals as leaders. They're kind of a new force on the kind of more math rock, but certainly kind of a prog thing, instrumental, incredible musicianship, but they, they're a huge band right now amongst musicians, animals as leaders. So cascade, which actually is with a K and then summer brings on uh, kind of my more, some of the jam bands that I like to listen to. I don't listen to any of that stuff during the winter, but during the summer, I, I break out all my grateful dead albums and, and get into some of the other stuff too. So Grateful Dead, been listening to a lot of different stuff, but Bertha is a song right now that I've been really enjoying this summer and the various some live versions of it. And then for Fish, bouncing around the room, mm. particularly the live version of it uh, on a live one. But two things that just stand out from a lot of listening to the Dead and Fish because it's summertime and you should be listening to that stuff during the summer. Yes, sir. I want to thank everyone for joining for episode two. We made it through episode two. And uh, well, I think now we should at some point do what, in episode three? Is that what comes next? I think we shall. I think we shall. So any parting thoughts, T? No, it's, it's, it's great. Um, you know, I enjoyed the discussion. Um, obviously, Phil Collins and Genesis, a, a tremendous uh, influence on, on you and, and obviously a, a huge drumming influence on you. So appreciate you. Uh, even though my rating probably wasn't, uh, you know, something that, that you uh, appreciate. I, I really enjoyed you uh, bringing this one to the table and enjoyed the discussion. Appreciate that. And T, if you told me you were drowning, I would lend a hand. Oh, buddy. God, I would lend a hand. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I was afraid for a while that you would not lend a hand. Thanks for tuning in guys. We'll see you soon. Two. That's about it.
That's all we have. I hope it wasn't too disappointing. We will see you on tour. Until then, take it easy.